So let's get into this. Um, one quick reminder before we um, get into topic three is that we have uh, um, tomorrow's our lab day and we need to finish off. Uh, if you haven't been working on it, I hope you have been. Uh, you need to do your lab one, two report and you know, lab three pre lab. So, just a reminder this is found on pages 37, 38 of the lab manual, and you're going to hand it in on Moodle. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. And uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, I noticed there's about five people who still have not submitted their plagiarism recognition certificate. Uh, I think I sent out an email on Monday to people who have not. Some people, it looks like they've submitted in some sort of draft form, but they need to go back in the middle and actually hit the submit button. So just a reminder of that. So what I'm gonna do for lab three is tomorrow morning, I will be sending you an email uh, with the instructions on how we are gonna be doing lab three. I have a, a recording of the experiment that I had done previously, and uh, that's what we'll be doing for lab three. So more on that um, tomorrow and, um, and over the next couple of weeks as we uh, work on lab three. All right, I see somebody has a question. Somebody, uh, go ahead. You can type in the question in the, in the chat box, or you can, or you can uh, turn on your microphone. Doesn't matter. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, Oh, so your uh, questions about the article couldn't find any match. Um, we can um, maybe that's some, something we can talk about with, with the class. Or well, uh, maybe we'll have to uh, schedule an office hour with me or or send me an email about it. Um, it's uh, going to take up too much class time to help you with that. Sorry about that. So we've talked about um, two types of microscopy so far. Uh, light microscopy and electron microscopy. And we're talking about a whole bunch of different types of uh, uh, techniques around them. So you had fluorescence and staining and SEM and TEM and all those kind of things. So what I want to tell you about now is kind of a newer type of microscopy that is getting some traction in biological research. Um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting kind of perspective. It's called scanning probe microscopy. So if you take a look at this uh, diagram on the left, what you have here is this uh, little, um, I don't know what you want to call it, a sensor. It's actually called a probe tip. And the probe tip literally actually just drags back and forth across the specimen. So it's kind of like a blind person, right? Uh, they're just feeling something, except for this is systematic, it's just back and forth. And what it is going to do is map the contours of that actual surface. So here are some, some diagrams. And, and actually, this probe microscopy is so sensitive that on some specimens, we can actually see individual atoms. So that's actually what you're seeing here. Over here on the left, you can see actual individual gold atoms. On the right, um, some silicon uh, surface atoms. So it can be, be very, very sensitive. Um, I'll show you some more pictures here. Uh, another cool thing that they can do is they can actually um, manipulate individual atoms. So if you take a look here, uh, this is IBM. And maybe you can recognize what they have written. They've written their corporate logo in, uh, I think it's gold or titanium or something like that. So this is this is a really cool kind of, uh, I mean, it's been around since I think the uh, late 1980s, um, but it's, uh, it's really gaining a lot of traction now. Uh, it used to be if you wanted one of these instruments, you had to build it yourself. So you had to have a lot of know-how. Now you can actually buy these things. So I want to show you a little video here. I'll play this to uh, there. Uh, so this was IBM. They made their corporate logo, and IBM decided they wanted to do something a little fancier. So what they did was they moved the atoms around and took uh, uh, images of it and made a little video of all of these atoms. So I thought I'd share it with you. It's pretty cool. And you see the date on this. This is actually almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it's a pretty incredible. I'll just play uh, uh, about a few seconds of it. To get it yeah. So pretty incredible in some ways. 
uh, that they can do this. And you can check the whole video, it's on, it's on YouTube, if you wanna check it out. Um, but let's talk a little bit about how this is used in biology. Um, there's different types of probe microscopy, they all have different acronyms. Uh, kind of the one that's gained the most amount of popularity in biology is this one called the Atomic Force Microscope, AFM. And uh, same idea as, as any probe microscope, it's dragging a tip back and forth. Uh, I found this one on the internet, apparently it's the world's fastest um, atomic force microscope. So I don't know how fast it is, I, I've never actually used this kind of technique. But I'll show you some images that are captured by atomic force microscopy. So here's a molecule and you can uh, kind of make up those benzene rings on it. Uh, for biological specimens, we can't get right down to the atom level. Uh, you probably know that biological specimens, well, we tend to be a little bit more squishy than say a metal surface or something like that. But we can still get some pretty Im interesting images. Uh, on the left, there's some erythrocytes. Those are uh, red blood cells. Um, maybe not the best image of them, but you get the idea. You can see uh, the shape. On the right, somebody basically has a platelet. And um, you can see, again, some very interesting detail on that. So this is going to become more and more common as the years go by, uh, as the techniques get better. On the left, you can see there's a virus. You can't see a virus with a, a light microscope. So you need an electron microscope. Or now you can use an atomic force microscope. Uh, e. coli there with some flagella. So some really interesting, nice pictures. There are some human chromosomes, some cancer tissue, and there's another uh, image of E. coli. So the color is added afterwards uh, for these, and you can see that uh, there's some bumps and whatnot in there. So it is actually physically touching the specimen. So sometimes there's a bit of squishing and destroying the specimen as, as it goes along. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, on the left is the model. On the right is the actual image of DNA, and you can actually make out the helical structure, which is very cool. You can also make out, you can see where the probe would basically drag back and forth to uh, measure the image. So really, really cool stuff. Okay, so I have a Kahoot for you. And uh, I think it's got six questions. I'll, I'll load that up and we can uh, do some Kahoot questions for fun here. So let me load this up. I guess I gotta share my screen. Uh, that would be this one here. There we go. There's the game number 950 Okay, give you about 10 more seconds and we'll get started. All right, here we go. On microscopy. Question one, what is resolution? Okay, so the correct answer is the blue one, the ability to distinguish two objects as distinct. So resolution is a measure of clarity, how sharp, how clear an image looks. Um, you can see the green one is not quite right. Uh, sharpness around the edges, that's contrast. Uh, that's the ability to tell uh, you know, two different zones, I guess, would be contrast, right? So resolution is clarity. All right. Question two, magnification can be improved by, so how can we make better magnification? All right, so size and shape of the lens is correct. Uh, focusing doesn't help to magnify something better, it just makes it sharper. And better material might improve the resolution, 
um, but uh, not necessarily going to uh, improve the magnification. All right, so question three, which of the following matchups is false? The correct answer is the uh, the green one. TEM actually stands for transmission electron microscopy. Uh, so let's just go through these for a second here. Um, light microscopy, you can you can look at dead or live things. Uh, so that one is true. Uh, SEM, SEM is scanning electron microscopy, and you can use that to visualize viruses. Uh, the blue one, confocal microscopy. Confocal microscopy uh, is a type of fluorescence. And uh, it's a type of fluorescence microscopy that is more expensive because it actually uses lasers. So by definition, uh, that is correct. Uh, TEM stands for transmission electron microscopy, not tunneling. So that is uh, the correct answer there. Okay, Tom and AK doing well, looks like. True or false, these types of microscopy are correctly ranked from lowest, highest magnification. So the correct answer, let me just go back and take a look at this here. Actually, uh, I apologize. Um, oh no, okay, never mind. That, that's correct, false. Uh, this is in the exact opposite order. So number one, probe microscopy has the highest magnification all the way down to compound microscopy, which has the lowest. So this is false because they're ranked in the exact opposite. So read the questions carefully. I got caught there for a second. All right, two questions left. Transmission electron microscopy is useful for looking at the three-dimensional surface of a specimen. And the answer is false. So this here is actually an image of a scanning electron microscope image. So that would be true if, you, if it's at SEM, not TEM. Our last question, is Tom gonna to hold on to his lead? Number six, which of the following would not be a practical method for looking at a clinical specimen like a blood sample? So the correct answer is the blue one, the scanning electron microscope. Um, so fluorescence microscope and a gram stain is using a normal traditional uh, microscope. Um, those are things that uh, I could train you how to use that in five minutes. Uh, and obviously a lab technician is gonna be uh, well-trained on one. Scanning electron microscope is not practical. Uh, and I think I talked about how these things are super expensive. Uh, the training is quite extensive and uh, um, it's, it's not a fast process where you just slap the specimen on the slide. The specimen preparation actually takes half a day too. So not very practical. So let's see what podium looks like and then we'll move on. Number three, Tom. Number two, Diesel, who got that gold? All right, well done, AK. All right, we are done here. Okay, so hopefully that went well. Um, I will be uh, posting these uh, uh, the playlists for the Cahoots on, um, on Moodle, so you get a chance to uh, re-review them before the final exam, just as an extra study tool. Uh, if I haven't done that already, I can't remember. I meant to post them on Moodle. If I haven't done it, I'll do it uh, before the midterm. So speaking of the midterm, I know it's not super close, but I think we're looking at what, around two and a half weeks away if I'm trying to remember the exact date of the midterm. Uh, so it's coming along and um, I wanna start to get you thinking about it and give you an idea what kind of questions you're gonna see on the midterm. Um, some of the questions are gonna be multiple choice. Some of them are gonna be short answer. 
and uh, some of them are going to be long answer. I hate to use the word long because this is not like an essay, uh, but this is uh, big enough. So I'll have uh, a couple of questions on the midterm that are going to be uh, a little bit longer. And uh, uh, I'll probably, uh, what I've done in the past is I get three of these type of questions and you pick your favorite two kind of thing. And so here's an example of a question like this with five marks. And so five marks, uh, as I mentioned, a mark is kind of a complete thought. Uh, and so if you were answering this in sentence form, that would be at least five sentences. Um, but you don't have to answer in sentence form. In fact, this particular question, uh, comparing the different types of microscopy, you could answer this in, a, in the form of a table. And it would, uh, it would probably look very nice. Um, probably what you're looking at is minimum of half a page of paper, um, depending on your handwriting size and, and those kind of things, but minimum of half a page. So looking for basically five good points. Now, in this case, you can see the question is comparing light microscopy and electron microscopy, right? So as I mentioned before, you do want to talk about at least that part of it. You know, what's going on with the light and what's going on with the electrons? And that would be one mark out of your, um, out of your five, right? Uh, there's other things that you can compare. Um, this kind of question is, is, is open enough that, you, that people are going to have different answers. Some people might talk about the different types of techniques. Uh, you're going to want to talk about things like magnification, which one is, you know, what what kind of uh, images are these things going to give you? Uh, we were just talking about in the um, in the Kahoot, you know, you might have dead or alive specimens. Um, and uh, you can see it's also asking you to uh, give some examples. So be as specific as possible. When you give me an example, don't just say, I could look at a cell under a light microscope. Well, sure, but what's different about what you're looking at compared to the SEM or the T? So maybe a stained bacterial cell might be a good example. Uh, SEM, you're looking at the surface, so maybe a bug's eye. TEM, you're looking at inside, so maybe you're looking at the inside of a cell at uh, ribosomes and mitochondria. So, so there's some tips on that. We will be talking more and more about the midterm as it gets closer. Like I said, we're not uh, super close yet, but I do want you to start thinking about it. I'm going to start uh, over the next uh, week uh, posting from mater some materials uh, for studying, such as the Kahoot links and and other things. I've already started uh, posting uh, those sample quizzes. Okay, I see there's some questions here. And, uh, oh, maybe not questions, just people have the date. So 13th of October. So yeah, that's about three weeks away. So it's gonna, gonna come quick. So much more on the midterm as we get closer to it. All right, so moving along. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other things that we do in the lab to study cells and some things that uh, um, mostly things that we're kind of seeing to some degree in biology 107. So one thing that we uh, started doing, and um, it's unfortunate you didn't, didn't get to see the, the final results in person, is uh, growing up bacteria. Uh, bacterial cells, of course, are super easy to grow compared to mammalian cells. They grow fast and uh, and often what we do is we, uh, we grow these things uh, on agar. So, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna go back for a second. But here's our agar plates right here. Uh, sometimes we grow them in test tubes, so we call that uh, liquid media. But what do we have in there is we basically have food and, uh, and water, right? And, and that's what the bacteria are growing in. Just wanna talk about these agar plates for a minute. Sometimes we call them Petri dishes. The agar actually comes from seaweed. So it's a carbohydrate extracted from seaweed. It's extracted. We buy it in a powdered form. Uh, it's a little bit like making jello. You add the agar, you add some of the, the broth media and water, and uh, you, you basically boil it, uh, although we, we use an autoclave, which is uh, pressurized steam. And, uh, and then you pour it in your, uh, your agar plate, the Petri dish, and it solidifies, and you get that nice medium that we use. So, you saw the pictures from lab one, and you can maybe see some different species of bacteria on your plates. And uh, so they're very, very useful kind of technique for culturing microbes. I uh, want to show you this, another video for you. I found this uh, as I was looking up something up, and I noticed that Google celebrated the birthday of uh, Julius Petri. Julius Petri, of course, is the inventor of the Petri dish. So I'll just play this for you. 
ready to go. And again, we've got uh, uh, some plates, and uh, I guess the question is, what is he or she doing there? And of course, this is Google and another corporation, and they made a corporate logo. And uh, it's kind of similar to what we did in Lab 1. You can see some of the things that we swap. I'm going to show that in a second. So an old sock. Uh, looks like a, a doorknob or something. A computer uh, keyboard. A dog's mouth. A plant. And kitchen dish sponge. So anyway, I thought I'd show, share that with you. It was kind of cute a little thing. Sometimes they do interesting things at Google. Uh, so if you did your if you did your lab one uh, and you took a look at the pictures, you're going to see a variety of different types of bacteria. We're going to be talking about uh, some ways to describe these different cultures uh, next week's lab. So a day and a week from now, we'll talk a little bit about uh, um, what these colonies and, and some descriptive terms. I think I have a slide here that, that uses some of these descriptive terms. So you can see circular, irregular, filamentous, and so on. And uh, Turns out that you can um, often, um, maybe not necessarily diagnose, but usually you have a pretty good idea of what it is if you worked in the lab long enough uh, of what kind of bacteria on your plate. So you can see there's two bacteria that we grow in the biology one of seven lab, uh, E. coli, forms these round and kind of shiny uh, colonies. They're sort of a creamy color. Uh, Bacillus subtilis is also a creamy color, but the colonies tend to be a lot flatter um, they tend to be more uh, spread out, and the edges are kind of um, not so well defined. So it's a pretty easy way to kind of think, okay, I probably have E. coli here, or I probably have bacillus. Unfortunately, a lot of them come out that kind of uh, creamy browny color, uh, so you're not necessarily sure until you look at it in a microscope. Found some other interesting ones on the internet. Thought these ones were just really cool looking. I don't even know what they are, but thought I'd share them with you. So I think I, we way back in topic one, we talked about Staphylococcus and uh, told you that Staphylococcus aureus is called Staphylococcus aureus because aureus is AU, which is the uh, um, element on the periodic table that means gold. So uh, hopefully um, you remember that one. And Staphylococcus epidermidis found on your skin and it doesn't grow gold. So um, often you can tell uh, you know, at least have an idea what your, your organism might be like. And again, this will be addressed further in lab four. And if you're just trying to have some fun, you can do art uh, using your Petri dishes. Uh, there's an entire website devoted to microbial art, in fact. And I found a couple of cool images there. I thought they were very nice. Reminds me of summer. So what else do we use solid media for? We use it for something called streaking. So here is a word of advice. <laughs> um, when you are on Google and you're in Google Images and you're looking for something, just think about what you're typing in. I, um, I was looking for some images of streak plates and I typed in streaking and instead of getting some microbiology stuff, I got the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, so not this kind of streaking, but we're actually talking about um, agar plate streaking. And this is something I'm gonna demonstrate for you in, uh, in the next lab, in lab um, uh, four. Unfortunately, you won't get a chance to do this in person. We just missed that with our uh, online period, but I'll just show you how streaking works. In streaking, what you do is you get an agar plate and you take some culture and you kind of smear it across part of the plate. So that's called a streak. And then what you do is you sterilize your instrument and you, you, um, you drag the instrument through the original inoculation and, uh, and basically spread it out some more. So hopefully what you're doing at this point is diluting that original culture a little bit. And then you can do that again, and can do that again, and here's what a plate might look like. So the whole idea here is to uh, basically isolate a bacteria so that you have uh, something called a colony. Uh, if you have too much culture, you kind of end up with these smears right here, and uh, you can't distinguish, do I have one or two species there? And, and so the whole idea is to get a, uh, one bacterium uh, isolated to part of that petri dish, it grows and becomes uh, some sort of uh, a colony that you can uh, then further culture and, and study and work on. So unfortunately, uh, we're not going to get a chance to, to practice this, uh, but I will demonstrate it for you in lab four. So I just want to mention that we, we can culture other types of cells out there. Uh, we don't just have to culture bacterial cells, but uh, 
Unfortunately, it's a lot more difficult with, uh, with other types of cells. Animal cells are, are much more difficult to culture. Uh, first of all, they need special dishes. Uh, if you think about your cells, your cells are all growing on, uh, they're attached to things. They're attached to bone, connective tissue and whatnot. And, and so animal cells, they like that. Um, so what you have to do is you have to get these special plates that are coated with collagen, uh, very uh, expensive nutrients. Uh, they're very slow to grow. Rather than growing over a day or two, you're, you're looking at often weeks. So they're not really that practical culture uh, in, in, the, in the lab here for, for you guys, unfortunately. Uh, there's my notes. They're expensive, specially coated services. Um, they may not divide very much. Some, some mammalian cells don't really divide very much. And uh, some don't divide at all, like your neurons. Once they're differentiated, they kind of stop dividing. So complex stuff. Um, we do have ways around it, uh, worth mentioning. And uh, you may have heard of these cells. These cells are uh, called HeLa cells. They're very famous. And uh, we've, uh, we've learned tons of things about human biology and cellular biology and genetics from these cells. And uh, they, uh, they're basically what they are is human cancer cells. So it turns out that human cancer cells uh, aren't as particular as normal human cells. They grow and they grow well and they thrive. And uh, this is uh, something that we, uh, we see in a lot of research studies using these particular cells because they grow really well. Uh, there's a really interesting human story behind this. You can see the Kela is actually uh, kind of an abbreviation of, of the name of the person who donated the cells. Uh, her name was Henrietta Lacks. And this was done, uh, I think it was in the 1950s. And uh, she had cervical cancer. And um, unfortunately, to make a, a sad story, she, she died from her cancer. And uh, the cells uh, went on and, and became very famous. And uh, eventually, they tracked down you know, who the cells came from. And, and the family found out. And they were a little upset because people were talking about their mom's cells. And, and uh, they didn't understand what was going on. Uh, this is not something that you're allowed to do nowadays in terms of particularly like if you have a, some sort of biopsy sample, you're not allowed to reveal to the media and whatnot who the sample was from and all that. But anyway, there's a very interesting book about it. If you like science uh, nonfiction books, this is one of the better ones out there. Uh, you can check it out, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Um, a side note, I think they actually made a movie about it with uh, Oprah. So. I think that's on HBO or something like that. So another thing that we sometimes need to culture is viruses. And why would we culture viruses? Well, um, a big one is to study them and to produce vaccine. And uh, of course, that's uh, very relevant nowadays. Now, the, um, uh, the, the vaccines that we're using in Canada, the messenger RNA vaccines, we're not actually culturing viruses. Uh, but in China, they are. Um, they are culturing the viruses in order to make the vaccine that they're using over there. So how do we culture viruses? So kind of back to what is a virus, it's an intracellular parasite. And so how does it grow? It has to grow inside of a cell. So I'll show you a few examples of how we might do that. Uh, so here's some bacteriophage. Remember, these are viruses that infect bacteria. And so you need to grow them on bacteria. So what you do is you spread a whole bunch of bacteria in a plate. This is called a lawn. And then you infect it with the viruses. And where the viruses grow, they kill the bacteria and form these little uh, pockets of, of dead lice cells. And so you call these plaques. So that's how we can grow bacteriophage. We grow them on their host, which is the bacteria. Uh, what about mammalian viruses? A pretty common way to do it is to modify them so that they can grow in uh, embryonic eggs, embryon-aided eggs. Uh, and this is actually how we grow up a bunch of our vaccines. Um, so the influenza vaccine, the mumps vaccine, measles, uh, maybe the measles vaccine, I can't remember that one now, uh, are grown in these embryonated egg cells, egg cultures. And uh, this is why if you ever get your, your shots, they often ask, are you allergic to eggs? Because some of these vaccines were grown in eggs. And of course, you, you do not want people to have allergic reactions. Uh, another way is we grow these in those HeLa cells. And you can use the HeLa cells to immortalize other cells and, and make, them, uh, make them cancerous. And uh, by the way, you can't just inject HeLa cells into people and give them cancer. Our, our immune system um, will, will, will uh, reject it, but you can grow the viruses in them. 
So something we're going to be talking about the lab is, uh, is a septic technique. I'm going to kind of skip over this now because I know what we're going to talk about in the lab. Um, so one last thing to mention uh, in terms of how we can study cells is uh, one way we can study cells is by doing a technique called cellular fractionation. And uh, so what I want you to learn about this is, is basically a definition of what it is. When we say this cell fractionation, what do we mean? And we mean we're breaking it apart and then we're somehow isolating the organelles. So how do we do this? Uh, you can break things apart mechanically. So you can use a blender. There's scientific blenders. They're just fancy kitchen blenders and not much different. You can use sonication, which is a high frequency sound. You can use detergents. And uh, in the end, what you get is homogenate. So that homogenate is going to be all the liquids inside the cells and, and the organelles and you know, kind of just in a, in a slurry. And then the second thing we do is we spin them in a centrifuge. So uh, if you spin things at a low speed, so you can see here's the speeds about a thousand times G. So this is a pretty standard uh, kind of centrifuge. Uh, you can actually spin out nuclei. Uh, they're heavy organelles, they're pretty big. Uh, you go at a higher speed, so this requires special types of centrifuges, about 20,000 G. You can start to get out uh, smaller organelles, such as mitochondria, chloroplasts, and, and a few other things. You spin at extremely high speeds, you can start to get out uh, pieces of membranes and ribosomes and, and, uh, and all sorts of things. So what I want you to know is basically what fractionation does. Two steps, you break the cells apart, and you can separate out the different components by uh, centrifuging at different speeds. Okay, so I was hoping to finish this topic a little earlier, but that's okay. Um, what I really want to do is talk about today and introduce um, some concepts around membranes. So membranes is topic four. Just give me a second here. I'm gonna gotta load that up. Load this up here, I have it all ready. Okay, I'm gonna share. Bear with me here. Okay, so there we go. All right, so topic three was all mostly on microscopy and then a few other kind of things at the end there. Um, topic four, five, and six are all on cell structures. So topic four is kind of like cell surfaces. You can see we've got membranes and cell walls and uh, a few other cell surface type of things. Topic five is going to be on prokaryotic and bacterial cells. And topic six is going to be on organelles and eukaryotic cells. And then we finished all those topics. Uh, we're going to do our midterm. So each of these is about roughly two lectures each, maybe one and a half, depending on the topic. Um, and uh, and that, will, that will be the next basically uh, two and a half weeks of our, our class here. So let's talk about what is a membrane. Membrane is, uh, you can see there's a definition there, a selectively permeable lipid bilayer. And um, it separates the cell or organelle from the surroundings. And uh, the membrane is actually, I thought I had a label on, on it, there we go. Membrane is made of different parts. It's made of fossil lipids, proteins, and carbohydrates. And so that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit about today. Uh, there's also some other things worth mentioning. We have an extracellular matrix here that's outside of the cell, and the cytoskeleton, inside of the cell, cell. And we'll, we'll get to those things eventually, just not today, probably not even next lecture either. All right, so let's talk about these membranes. Um, so there's a lot to break down in that particular definition. You can see it says selectively permeable. We're going to talk about that permeable part next day. And uh, today we want to just talk a little bit about the structure of these membranes. We want to talk about uh, uh, kind of these three components that we have here. So we've already talked about the lipids and actually that's where we're going to start. I guess I have the numbers on these wrong. It should be one lipids, two, two proteins and three carbohydrates. I don't know how to mess that up. But the first thing is talk about these lipids. And we've already talked about these phospholipids uh, way back in topic two. So if you remember what a phospholipid is, a phospholipid has, uh, you have this glycerol. So remember uh, there was a diagram and uh, so this is glycerol. Sorry, I'm not gonna write it all here. 
glycerol. And we had um, two fatty acid chains. So this is a fatty acid. This is a fatty acid. And then we had a phosphate and some sort of polar group. So what they do is they kind of draw the polar group up here, like this. And then we have these two hydrophobic legs, these fatty acids. And so that's how we kind of draw the phospholipids. You can see there's a space-filled structure over there on, on the right of a phospholipid. And so, um, so this, these molecules are kind of unique. You throw them in water and the hydrophobic parts clump together. So the fatty acids clump together and the polar parts can interact with water and they form these things called bilayers. Uh, I think I have another uh, picture here. Here's the phospholipid. So I guess I did all that drawing for nothing because this one is so much more beautiful than my, my drawing. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there's a name for this kind of molecule, by the way, a molecule that has hydrophobic and hydrophilic parts. And that word is amphipathic. So it's a good definition to know what is an amphipathic molecule. It's a molecule that has hydrophobic and hydrophilic regions and interact with water and hydrophobic things. And an example, of course, is a phospholipid. So like I said, you throw a bunch of these into water and you get these, um, you get these bilayers that's shown in the previous one. But one thing I just want to uh, mention is that um, not all cells have these unique bilayers. So bacteria and eukaryotes, uh, we have kind of a traditional bilayer of these phospholipids. And uh, just worth mentioning that archaea, uh, some of them do something uh, a little bit different. So we'll come back and talk about archaea in the next unit, but it's just worth mentioning now when we're talking about phospholipids and that some of them actually produce these unique, uh, I guess they're called monolayers where you have, uh, it's kind of like linking two phospholipids together. You can see there's no, no um, separation in the middle to get this big weird molecule that has uh, basically a polar section on each end and it's connected by some, um, some fatty acid uh, molecules in the middle. And, and, and these archaeal organisms are, uh, are, are, they're a little tougher. They're more resistant to intense heat and whatnot. So more on archaea later. So the second thing to mention are these membrane proteins. So you take a look at this uh, phospholipid bilayer here. Uh, this section here is hydrophobic. And this section here, which is interacting with water, is polar or hydrophilic. And uh, so these proteins are going to have those kind of properties. Parts of them might be polar, parts of them might be hydrophobic. That are going to be able to interact with the uh, uh, with the phospholipid bilayer. So let's just take a look at these things, um, and uh, we, we kind of give uh, the different types of proteins different names. And so the, uh, the the proteins that are embedded. So you can see these ones here. They're embedded uh, right in the middle of the membrane. Um, these are called integral proteins. So integral is kind of derived from the word integrated, and uh, so um, this protein here, the sections that are kind of in the middle that are interacting with the, um, the hydrophobic part of the bilayer are going to be hydrophobic. And the sections over here that are interacting with water are going to be polar. And so they're going to have both polar and hydrophobic amino acids as a part of their, uh, as a part of their, their amino acid sequence and primary structure. Um, we also have uh, some membrane proteins. If you did a cellular fractionation and you uh, isolated membranes, you're going to get other proteins um, that are kind of, um, they're associated with the membrane. Uh, they're not embedded. And these ones are called peripheral. So peripheral is more loosely associated. So some terms to know, and uh, those words will probably come up again here or there. Uh, sometimes we use different terms for these. Sometimes I've seen the term transmembrane, meaning it's, it's transversing the membrane. And uh, you can see in my note there about having hydrophobic amino acids. So by the way, if you want to get across a membrane, well, that's about 20 amino acids and if you want to get across a membrane. And that would be hydrophobic ones. And then these uh, loop regions would be the, uh, the polar amino acids. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different varieties on how you can do this, how you can uh, be a membrane protein. You can uh, cross the membrane once. You can see there's a couple of different types there. You can cross the membrane a whole bunch of times. 
Um, some of these, uh, some of these proteins, um, like this one here, this is a, a lipoprotein. Lipoprotein. So it is a protein that has a lipid attached to it, and so this little blue thing is a lipid, and it, uh, it's kind of like an anchor. It's uh, anchoring itself into the membrane right there. Uh, you can see it has a peripheral one here. It's not even attached to the membrane at all, but it's attached to that other membrane protein. So huge amount of variety in how they can do this. And uh, in your travels, you might, you might uh, see some of these different things. Uh, there's a protein that I worked on, um, and uh, this is called a penicillin binding protein. And uh, this one was anchored by one alpha helix, so 20 amino acids that would trans uh, go across the, uh, the plasma membrane. All right, so what do membrane proteins do? I think that's another good question. Um, the phospholipids are kind of mostly structural. They're kind of just the main part of the membrane, uh, but the proteins have many, many functions. And some of these functions we'll talk about in, in future units. So some of these proteins are involved in molecular transport. So they're channels that can move things back and forth. And so we're going to talk about membrane transport uh, next day, next lecture. Uh, some of them are enzymes. So many of the proteins in your cell are enzymes, and some of them just happen to be membrane proteins. Uh, some of these are involved in signal transduction. We're not going to talk about sig signal transduction in this class. If you take biology 201, we we'll talk about it in a whole bunch of detail. But basically what that means is you have some sort of molecule coming along. So let's say a hormone or a neurotransmitter, and it's, uh, it's bound by some sort of um, a protein on the surface. And that protein takes the signal and says, hey, the hormone is here, and relays that to the cytoplasm and carries a message. So that could be insulin or, or any number of different hormones. Uh, lots of other things. Some are involved in cell recognition. So communication between uh, different tissues in your body. Some are like rivets where they're joining your tissues together. That's a good thing. Um, and some are attaching to the uh, cytoskeleton exocellular matrix. So we're not gonna get into any details on these here today, uh, but just mention many functions of membrane proteins. So the last one uh, to talk about are membrane carbohydrates. So not all membranes necessarily have carbohydrates and, uh, and they're usually not found in, in massive amounts. Uh, membranes are about 50-50 weight for phospholipids and proteins, um, but, uh, but many different types of membranes have carbohydrates. So you can see the carbohydrates are actually pictured here in green and uh, they're pictured uh, on the outside of the cell. So I'll, I'll explain why they're, um, they're on the outside of the cell in a moment. So these carbohydrates are usually in two forms. They're glycoproteins or glycolipids. So what does that mean? It means the carbohydrates are not by themselves. They're covalently attached to some other membrane structure. So they're covalently attached to a phospholipid or they're covalently attached to a membrane protein. And that's how you, you find the carbohydrates. That's just kind of the nature of, of uh, how they're assembled in the, um, in the cells. Um, so these are made through a process called glycosylation. So glycosylation, maybe I'll put a definition for you here. Uh, this is the process of adding a carbohydrate. So as I mentioned before, anytime you see glyco, it has something to do with the carbohydrate. Uh, so glycogen, of course, is a type of carbohydrate, but you have a glycoprotein, it means it's a protein with a carbohydrate, a glycolipid, a lipid with a carbohydrate, glycosylation is the process of adding carbohydrate. So you're probably wondering, okay, great, what are these carbohydrates doing? Um, these carbohydrates are mostly involved in uh, cell-to-cell recognition. I, I kind of like to think of them as little tags or little labels. So the little, um, you know, each of the tissues in your body has different types of carbohydrates on it. So your blood cells have uh, blood group carbohydrates, A, B, A, A, uh, a B, and O uh, carbohydrates. You may be familiar with blood types, um, but all of your tissues have different carbohydrates on them. Uh, and this is so that our body can figure things out. Uh, you know, you want to have uh, different carbohydrates on your skin um, cells, different carbohydrates on your blood cells, different carbohydrates on your liver cells. And this helps your body grow and develop, right? If you think about, you know, a long time ago, 
we all started off, we were one fertilized cell and uh, eventually it needed to differentiate and has to have ways to tell different tissues apart to know, okay, we're forming heart tissue over here, a lung tissue over here, a bone tissue over here and so on. And so they're really important for multicellular organisms. And um, of course, it's really important if you get a, um, a transplant or a, or a, a blood donation uh, that you are having compatible carbohydrates, because um, if not, you can have a, a pretty severe immune reaction, which, which can be fatal. So think of membrane carbohydrates, like I said, as little tags that, uh, that identify the cell type and the tissue type. All right, so um, here's a test yourself question. And I'm gonna to try to pop these up once in a while just to give you an idea of the types of questions you might see on midterms. Um, so there's gonna be multiple choice questions as part of your midterm. And uh, to answer these multiple choice questions, um, it's not guesswork. You have to be able to read carefully and you need to know what all of these terms mean. So I'm going to go through uh, each of these and uh, we'll see which, which one is not true, just to make sure we can remember what all these words mean. So the first one, it says, uh, so what we're looking for is the one that's not true, by the way. So which one's false? So integral proteins, integral protein uh, are found embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. So that is true. Remember the integral or their integrated proteins, they are found embedded uh, by definition. Uh, peripheral proteins are loosely associated with the membrane, so that is also true. By definition, peripheral means kind of on the outside. Um, C, membrane proteins can be channels that allow molecules to pass the fossil of the bilayer. Yes, we just mentioned that a minute ago, that that is one of the possible functions of a membrane protein. All right, D, integral membrane, integral proteins must be comprised of mostly, mostly hydrophilic amino acids. So, Remember that integral proteins are embedded. And remember that the, um, the inside of the membrane is hydrophobic. So this one here is the false one. So we'll put an X beside that one. And then the last one, peripheral proteins and enzymes. Yes, that was one of the functions. So you need to understand what all these terms mean. What is integral, what is peripheral? So this is part of your studying is to get the language of the course uh, in your brain so you can read these and make sense of the whole thing. And you can see there's concepts in there in terms of you know, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and those kind of things. So at some point I will be putting up a, uh, a sample midterm and uh, those quiz questions I'm putting up, I'm hoping those, all those things will help prepare you for the, uh, for the actual midterm. So there we go, a little arrow there. So let me just see where we are. This is where I wanna finish off and uh, to say that this is the um, uh, this is kind of the current model of a biological membrane that we have, and it was actually proposed quite a few years ago. And I'm not going to get into the history of, of different membrane models and all that, but uh, um, this is the model of our of our membranes. We call this the fluid mosaic model, and we're going to talk about a little bit more about this fluid mosaic stuff next day. But the basic idea is that you have this uh, kind of like this. Uh, uh, ocean of phospholipids, but it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's just a layer, this phospholipid bilayer, and, and that part is fluid. And the phospholipids can actually move around a little bit like a, a liquid. Um, not like water, something like a thick salad dressing is a bit more accurate. And uh, the mosaic part, of course, are the proteins, and the proteins are found uh, embedded and studded um, within the actual membrane. So next day, we're going to come back and talk about this model uh, just a little bit more. And we want to talk about membrane transport, which is one of the major functions of the membrane, how things get through and pass across uh, the phospholipid bilayer. And uh, so we'll get into a lot of details on that. So that's where we're, we're finishing today. So thank you for coming out. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Uh, look to your emails tomorrow morning for uh, the Lab 3 information. And uh, I will be available tomorrow afternoon uh, via Zoom, uh, the same Zoom link. You can connect me uh, tomorrow afternoon at between 2 and 4 o'clock. Um, if you have any questions about the lectures or the labs, I'll be available for, for at least two hours from starting at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon.